Uh, I guess let's start then. Uh, I'm already recording, boys. <laughs> <laughs> that, a little forewarning would be nice, but now you have to do all the effort I'll, to I'll, balance all of our audios at the same point, so... It's fine. Cock and ball torture is what I strive for, apparently. <laughs> Obviously, okay yeah. then. Alrighty. The, 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 future Ed, take that out. <laughs> okay, okay. Future Ed, leave that in. It's funny. <laughs> it is actually. By yeah. The the, by the end of the night, I'm not fucking schizophrenia. All right. Uh. I guess. I guess I'll start them. I don't know how to start All this because right. the first time I've started something like this. Do you want me to start? I can start. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start because I have a funny meme planned up. Oh, okay. Let's hear the funny meme. <laughs> my ears. I warned you that I'm gonna put why? my mic a bit closer than usual. <laughs> I can see why it's now. Fine. Oh. SC picked it up perfectly. Because I te <laughs> First it did. It SC picks up everything. It picks up my pages it, flipping in my it book. It picks up the sweat that's going down my throat. Uh. Hi. <laughs> it literally picked. It literally picks up every single, like, slight, br like, sh breath I make. Like, holy shit. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This, welcome to the Shower Initiative podcast. This is sort of the pilot episode, except we're not going to take your opinions into consideration. So basically, like, any Paramount TV show. Yes, because th th those are terrible. Um, <laughs> anyways, this... <laughs> Ah, <laughs> topical. <laughs> this this podcast focuses on how do I say this? Discussing the things that don't typically get discussed very often in relations to D and D. Yep. And my name is uh, it's Ed, but I I'm oftenly referred to as Rat. And uh, my two co-hosts are Mug. Sup. And then we got Fellwinter. How's it going? The, the man with the books. I'm the resident DM of sorts. Uh, a little bit of a... Well, I'm a veteran of DM. I'm the I'm resident game DM breaker. Like five years. And I'm the guy who's happened to trying his hand at DMing. So we have no idea what we're talking about, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, a little bit. We have a little bit of an idea. No, yeah. So this, the topic of today's video, I guess, vampires. Yes, vampires. There's a lot of goofy stuff with vampires that I think needs to be discussed at times. Yeah. So. Yeah, it really does. So, Fellwinter, can you flawlessly segue us into the first topic about vampires? As I put you on the I spot. I definitely can. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm. I do well under the spotlight. So. Uh, the thing that kicked off this entire podcast was a discussion on vampires and what it means for vampires to be, like, turned by holy symbols in the context of D&D. &D. To specify, this was a t conversation that happened at, like, three in the morning. <laughs> During, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, um, basically the idea is in, uh, classic vampire literature, think Bram Stoker's Dracula... Uh, vampires don't like crosses very much, or holy symbols of any kind. Call it a s However, in D&D, &D, uh, these deities are very apparent and send down magic fireballs. So what does this mean for vampires? Yeah, honestly, it's almost like a stereotype. It's like... We're, we're digging into the vamp psyche with this episode. Yep. Neither of us are vampires. If you're a vampire out there, just be, be sure to like tell us if what we're seeing is wrong. Yeah, just give us a call. Just to, 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 you know, f figure out a number or something. Contact contact us through Discord, or or just t contact us. You know, through the mind. You know, but uh, you can reach Rat at five five five. Oh shit! People <laughs> <laughs> um, box. <laughs> so yeah, a as you mentioned, deities they're fucking everywhere in D anD. d And oh, yeah. unless if you're playing a D anD. d campaign that has absolutely no influence in deities whatsoever. First of all, that's boring. <laughs> Second of all, okay, this probably won't won't fit in then too well. But essentially, the the main topic, or the main thing that like uh, the the main points that got brought up, I guess you can say, is um, 
could if deities do exist in your universe and vampires are against these religious symbols would that mean that they too also believe in these deities personally uh, I'm sitting here it makes sense the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that there's probably about three different uh, takes that vampires would have on these deities. Uh, they would either malign them and just generally dislike them. They would try to follow one in hopes that that deity would cleanse them from their ailment or just make it so that they're not turned by holy symbols. Uh, or they would like go full rejecting it outright. There's got to be some kind of like better reason than you some, know this this deity some exists. scientific explanation yeah so, they would turn arcane instead of divine so with, with, in that instance would would vampires just spend decades and decades of their lives trying to find a logical explanation as to why is it whenever i go to this funny looking cross i start to burn alive <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah yeah but actually, I'd like to lead this off with something interesting mm. uh, that I found in my research in the Monster Manual on page 297 of the Monster Manual. I didn't bring my Bible, sorry. Uh, well, it's okay, because I brought enough for the whole class. Uh, there's nothing on here about them being afraid of holy symbols. So at first, I was really dejected and thought, well, shoot, this whole conversation is now completely pointless. It's fine, it's fine. We got, we got other ideas. Don't worry. Happen. <laughs> actually... I thought about it more. You know what vampires count as for monster classes, right? Like what type oh, of monster they are? They undead. undead. They're undead, which means turn undead affects them. Which means clerics can still make them afraid of holy symbols. So what you're trying to tell me is, it's not so much the holy symbols themselves that they're scared of, but it's more so a blessing yeah, almost? The divine, the, divine? Yeah, the divine power channeled through the holy symbols. What turns so them. let me get this straight. Let's say you have a cleric, you just bless, fuck, I don't know, a spoon. Could you then yeah. just theoretically throw that spoon at a vampire, and now they'll just, like, be burned in holy fire? Well, they wouldn't burn in holy fire, but they would be turned if they failed the wisdom saving throw. Like, if you're, like, a cleric of cooking, right, and your holy symbol is <laughs> a giant wooden ladle, you could beat a vampire with the Can ladle I just say, and turn undead, and they fear. That is a very based subclass. Uh, yeah. It's a really good idea. <laughs> the divine domain of home cooking. Hey, cooking can be holy. It can also hurt people. So essentially, so hey. so from what, what I've got, what I've extracted from this conversation so far. So essentially, stereotypes. Uh, the holy symbol doesn't have to be, you know, just the stereotypical, oh, crucifix, fucking make vampire angie. It can be technically whatever. So long as yeah. it's divine, I guess you could say. In fact, in the context of D&D, &D, it probably wouldn't even be a cross. It would be, like, the door symbol of the Traveler, or, like, a book if it's knowledge domain, I don't know. The the hammer of the forge god, yeah. or something yeah, like yeah, that. Exactly, now, exactly. I have a very interesting theory to bring up that I literally just thought of just now, so I think it's perfect. So, belief, believing it, so now, here's my other question. Does it actually have to be the divine, or does it have to be the belief in the divine? Because let's say, it has. hypothetically speaking, right, I have a glass of water and I'm a cleric, and I, I stumble across a vampire, but I didn't have time to, like, you know, bless the waters with holy juju, or whatever, and I just say, hey vamps, this is a holy glass of water, and I just, like, spray it on them. <laughs> Would their belief in the fact that that is a holy glass of water affect them in any sort of way, or would it just be, ah, oh, shit, I guess I'm wet now? So here's an interesting thing about that. Uh, the holy part doesn't matter. It's just water in general. Vampires don't like. I didn't know that, actually. That's be, entirely coincidental. It has, to be, it has to be a copious amount of water. A glass of milk, so, in this instance. <laughs> uh, okay, glass, probably not. It has to be running water. But they take 20 acid damage for every turn they're in running water. So if you put a, uh, a vampire in a shower, they would hurt quite a bit. <laughs> well, I guess I know in the next campaign if I'm ever dealing with a vampire how to deal with them. 
Which now here's so you can question. stick them into a bath like a cat. But, like but now, they're just gonna be sitting there hissing <laughs> as you just shove their head into a fucking shower. So now, that's the question though, because it says running water. It specifies running. Can vampires take baths? Because that's not running water. That's just a static. And here's water. another point. Yeah, no, baths would make sense. Here's another question then. Wouldn't the absolute easiest way to identify if someone is a vampire if you didn't want to cast I don't know good like good or evil or whatever? Wouldn't the easiest way to identify if, uh, if somebody is a vampire is by their stench? Because if they don't Possibly. if they don't take you know showers because you know they're gonna get hurt by it, and you know the you know the saying deodorant isn't a shower. <laughs> Well, only rich people can afford showers in D and D. But what if it's true? But what if it's just a poor vampire then? Well, then in this instance, then they'd probably smell like a dumpster. Yeah, but they would just smell like a poor person. Hmm. Like the other poor people. Yeah, they would just <laughs> smell like a peasant. Cause yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking about it is with a vampire, they could totally take a bath because it's still water. Well, it, yeah. It's not running. Yeah, it's just water. It, it's not nor like water. It, yeah, but nor is it, like, blessed by a priest. But what constitutes running water? Uh... I would say it has to be flowing or, yeah. like, raining down in a certain if, way. It, but if you it's say like flowing, but work. then if you get into a bath, wouldn't the water just go all over the place? Well, I mean, if you get in a bath, it's not running water. It's a sta- That's like saying that a lake is running water. Well, that's water what I mean. It's like, waves. wouldn't the bath cause getting into it wouldn't that cause like some small waves to form okay they take 20 points of acid damage and then nothing happens because it stops running hmm. so i consider running water to be like water that's moving at us water that's moving when a person's not in it it's like a river is running water but a bath isn't yeah a constantly be because mo- it's running water so yeah like constantly moving. Let, let me just re let me just give a, a more i guess layman's term version of your explanation what you constitute as running water is water that is running without any sort of other influence without like any like human the input. creature getting into an influence yeah yeah man-made influence so then in that instance well, no. but showers then yeah showers are running water okay what do you think the term is running a bath a bath <laughs> well i mean either way Running a shower is not a term people use, but it still affects the same situation. So essentially, what we've learned so far is the go- gods exist, and shower uh, and vampires tend to be very stinky. Yep, that's basically it. Unless they're noble and can afford a bath on a pretty consistent basis. Because hmm. I mean. No, no, like, random normal peasant is gonna be going to a bathhouse every other week and just going, like, well, time to clean up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, not at those prices. <laughs> no, because, I mean, like, half the time those things, those places are, like, a gold for an hour. Sh- uh, for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> like, your entire week's wages for, like, a 30-minute bath. Yeah. And to a peasant, that ain't fu- that ain't worth it. Yeah, You're gonna just be jump in the river. Yeah. Okay. What what else can we talk about vampires? Just on the spot here. Uh, the idea of a vampire cleric is very interesting. How would that like work? <laughs> yeah, because I'm sitting there going, you have a divine symbol, but you can't touch that divine symbol. I and mean, you're just nothing, genuinely afraid. There's nothing rules is written that specifies that a vampire can't touch a holy symbol. They just get affected by turn undead. That's as close as we've been able to find to... Like, yeah. Because it does... Yeah. I, I will say, though, it's really funny, because it says each undead you can see or hear within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw under turn undead. Um, does a vampire get affected by its own turn undead if it can't see itself? Hmm. Because you can't see. Oh, but it's see or hear, and I assume that. Yeah, you you speak a prayer censoring the undead. Does a vampire cleric get turned by their own turn undead? I, you know, I would think yeah. Because I mean, if they're he- <laughs> if they can hear their own voice, like you know how we're hearing it right oh, yeah. now, it would be effective against them yeah. because they are undead. 
I'm just imagining like a vampire cleric runs into a lich, tries to turn on dead, both of them fail, they just run in opposite directions. <laughs> they just drop the holy symbol and book it away from each other. How would that work though? I mean, that's like that's, that's so... some Scooby Doo type shit right there. Yeah. <laughs> so what is so what does turn undead actually do? Does that just push away? So turn undead, uh as an action you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer, censoring the undead. Each undead you can see or hear within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw. If a creature fails the saving throw, it is turned for one minute or until it takes any damage. Like, a turn like creature physically must turned? Its... Yeah, it, turn undead literally just turns undead around. It's the funniest thing. They do a complete 180, I guess. So then in that instance... As, as, <laughs> as specified, a turned creature must spend its turns trying to move as far away from you as it can, and it can't willingly move into a space within 30 feet of you. But... It also can't take reactions. But now the question is, so if a vampire <laughs> cleric uses turn undead, then the, the, you can't exactly walk away from the caster, can you? So, uh, in that instance, I would say you you drop the holy symbol and you run away from that. Because <laughs> I assume that that's, like, the closest you can get. That or you just curl into a ball and have an existential crisis because you're afraid of yourself. That or your soul leaves your body. But, <laughs> I... A very creative way to cast astral projection. Uh, Personally, I'm a fan of the having an existential crisis as they, like, go into the feel position on the ground. <laughs> you gain a point of madness. Use the magic system from DMG. So from what I'm from what I'm hearing, <laughs> vampire clerics are just completely fucking useless. <laughs> well, not 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 well, so much against maybe. undead. Not so much useless, but more so pointless. I can see a vampire cleric being a really interesting character, like trying to go. Maybe they didn't choose to be a vampire; they were cursed with it, and so they go on a a journey trying to find a cure for their own vampirism and the way that they figure out to get rid of it is to possibly be like a knowledge domain cleric to try and find like hidden lore on vampires to try and undo it yeah it could make I, a very interesting character concept yeah and i mean heck even with like something almost like a vampire paladin of just like they tr they worship or have a deal with like a god or something like that or yeah like, and just they're trying to get this god to cure them of their vampirism yeah. or vampirism hmm. like, cause yeah I mean honestly in a fluffing kind of way like it really just like gives you like a decent reason of like why you're doing all of these like noble acts as a vampire yeah you're yeah it would be really cool to play like a like a good vampire or not even good. You can play like an evil vampire who's only doing all these good things just to cure themselves, and they don't actually care about the people. So they're yeah. only out there to, to cure themselves. I just just like a chaotic neutral type idea, or like a neutral evil kind of thing. I'm gonna have to ask for an explanation on one of their weaknesses, forbiddens. <laughs> forbiddens. Oh yeah, That's it. That's a fun one. It states one. that a vampire cannot enter any sort of residencies without a direct invitation from one of the occupants. <laughs> yeah, so, like, you have to be invited in as a vampire in order and to that's, enter someone's home. That's classic vampire. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's old school. That's straight up taken from, like, Bram Stoker. <laughs> so yeah. now, does it, I'm reading this letter for letter, and it doesn't exactly specify whose residency. So does that mean... That, yeah. let's say, hypothetically speaking, a vampire and his vampire family, right? One of them just, like, goes out to, like, get groceries or some shit. And then he tries to come back, but he can't actually enter his own home. Would he just have to yell for, like, one of the kids or something to, like, go open the door for him or something? Like, what would... No. That's a very... It, yeah. It, it has to be... It's someone else's resi uh, residence. Yeah, because the vampire lives in his own home, so he is a resident, so he can give himself uh, permission to enter. Hmm. But when when it comes to somebody else's home, like a peasant's home, and he wants to, you know, you know, suck the blood out of this particular peasant, that's nice. If that peasant just <laughs> says, if the, yeah, if that yeah. peasant tells him to fuck off and he can't come in, he can't do jack. A police? Yeah, he's stuck outside. A police officer yep. legally cannot arrest you unless if you say no. <laughs> 
<laughs> or like, I think about it even funnier. Like, it's raining in the middle of the city. The vampire, you know, went out at night to get something, and now it's raining. He can't enter any of the homes because everybody's like, "Go away, leave me alone." Twenty acid damage. <laughs> and this is how poor vampires are killed. Yep. Please help me. I'm burning. So let's Piss off. let's say damage. you have a cleric vampire now, right? Is it safe to presume uh-huh. that cleric vampires would probably be, uh, would probably utilize churches? Uh, yeah, you could totally yeah. have a church be the the home base of a cleric vampire. I wasn't gonna suggest a home base. I was gonna say more so like they go into it if they need to like restock on like holy supplies or whatever. So in that instance, yeah. would they just have to like yell for like one of the priests to like politely let them in despite the fact that they were a vampire? <laughs> See, here's an interesting thing about that. Uh, a lot of religions consider churches to be the home of their gods, so they could just ask for permission from their deity so would, to enter the church. So they the just church. do like a quick booty call on the deity and be like, "Hey, yo, Holmes, can I go to your homes?" <laughs> like, yeah, basically, they just yeah, they would. Ha- oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> they'd have to-, to contact their deity every time they want to do something in a church. Uh, I want to go to my now, church. Roll divine intervention. But now, in this instance, so what if your D and D world has more than one religion? I mean, most do. Uh, yeah, most do uh, already. So now, in yeah, this, I, <laughs> and now in this instance, would they just have to yell for like, or like holler at like another priest or something, or like yeah. ask their deity to contact that deity so they can go in their home? Like, they they would probably have to contact some of the church staff because, like, in the olden times, the church was also a monastery. Well, yeah, that's why that's why I bring it up that the priests would so, presumably yeah. be living at the church. Yeah, I, I would I would rule it that it way, be, personally. Yeah, it'd be more so of a monastery than, than an actual church or anything. You cannot enter. I mean, if you're doing it the god way, then it's like it's literally like almost like you have to call your parents everywhere you go. <laughs> like, oh, we're going to little we're going to Jimmy's house. Can I go to Jimmy's yeah. house? All right, you can go. Oh, we're going to Billy's house. Let's go to Billy's house. It's like a broken <laughs> telephone type of system. Like, <laughs> so now here's another question, right? A va- let's say a vampire cleric needs to get into a mansion to steal something from the rich noble's desk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, vampire cast dimension door to get into the house. What is dimension? Oh, is he be... able to? So dimension door is you can you create a portal to any place within five hundred feet, and you can you just teleport there. It's basically like Misty Step, but five hundred feet. Wow. Okay. It really. So, is just mis- oh, holy. Oh my. Can they do that because they're entering a residence without permission? So what happens? Because they don't actually enter the residence; they're magically put within the residence. Oh, let me uh, let me just like. Do they just like ricochet towards the door? Let me read the. It, it doesn't say about any sort of like consequence okay. for not it's, for being it, like put. I'll, I'll read the yeah. description for any who does not know Dimension Door. <clears throat> So it's for bards, sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. So clerics cannot actually cast this. Okay? So Clerics cannot cast Dimension Door. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I thought they would be able to as well. But fuck it. Yeah, I... Wait, no. I could have sworn... According to the Rule 20 Net wiki, no, they cannot. But yeah. Uh, so what does it do? You teleport yourself from your current location to any other spot within range. You arrive at exactly the spot desired. It can be a place you can see, one you can visualize, or one you can describe by stating distance and direction, such as, and this is an example, 200 feet straight downward, or upward to the northwest at a 45 degree, that is so, holy shit, that's specific. Yeah, it's a good one. You can bring along objects as long as their weight does not exceed what you can carry, you can also bring one willing creature of your size or smaller who is carrying gear up to its carrying capacity. The creature must be within five feet of you when you cast the spell. If you would arrive in a place already occupied by an object or a creature, you and any other creature traveling with you take 46 force damage and the spell fails to teleport you. <laughs> Interesting. So let's say, like, yeah, you teleport yourself, except you, like, enter the kitchen... And you're like in the middle of the table. Get fucked, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we could also in the future put up the spell description on the video. Oh, I'll do that. Uh, Don't worry. I I'll, okay. I'll Yeah. I'll have to get like instead of reading it out. I'll have to get like a instead. list or something. I mean it's better to read it out. 
for any who is not actually watching this video, but more still listening to it. Also, 7th level Trickery Domain clerics get Dimension Door, so that's probably why mm. we have two people of us that remember mm -hmm. a cleric using okay. Dimension Door. Yeah, that's a specific subclass. Okay. Yeah, so that's why I was like, I could have sworn I've seen that somewhere. But, uh, uh, yeah, I have seen it somewhere. It was the Trickery Domain cleric. Anyway, continue. But yeah, no, so back to the, the question. Would a vampire who does not have permission to enter, say in this instance, a mansion, but they try to use Dimension Door, what would happen if they if they tried that? Because, like I said, if you're, if you're reading it out to a T, it states you arrive at exactly the spot desired. But, like, you bring up a good point. So, would they, I don't know, would they ping pong all the way to, like, the front door of that residency? Or would they, like, be frozen until they ask politely, hey, can I be here? <laughs> yeah, like... Honestly, that is a super good question. <laughs> so here's the interesting point, right? It's entering the residence. So do you consider appearing magically inside the residence entering? Because well, the entering, in my opinion, is like the crossing of the threshold into Well, here's the, house. the thing. I mean... God, this... I gotta get out, like, a dictionary now. <laughs> <laughs> what constitutes entering Yeah, what constitutes as entering a building? Because you could, yeah, you could just, like, go on through the front door. That You're, you're entering the building that way. I believe, and I'm a fan, I, I'll, 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 I'll be bold, and I'll say it. Going inside of a different structure from where you just were would be entering that structure, no matter how you get into it. So be it teleportation, be being you flew in, you jump through the window, they get, doesn't fucking matter. As long as you are on those floorboards of a building that is surrounded by some sort of walls or whatever, or some sort of fence, or actually probably not a fence, I mean you'd still be outside in that instance, yeah. but some sort of, no, I some sort of like roof or, you know, walls or whatever, I co I, I'd constitute yeah. that as being inside, or like entering inside of a different building. But now, this begs another question, let's say hypothetically... They want to enter a castle. Castles don't... Not all castles necessarily have rooftops. You, That would be the main castle yeah. key. They still have courtyards. So would you constitute entering a castle being passing through the gates of the castle? Or going into the keep of the castle, specifically? Because there's no I there's no sort of rooftop or anything. It's all, it's all open roof. I would say because the, the book specifies residence... It would be the living section of the castle because you don't like you don't live you don't in the courtyard the lawn yeah you don't consider your front lawn your residence you just consider that your property yeah there's a different like if that was the case vampires wouldn't even be able to walk up to your door they would just shout at you from the road hey can i walk on your grass but in that instance i mean homeless people live on the road sometimes so they wouldn't even be allowed on the road they wouldn't be allowed no, anywhere because that's not a residence because homeless implies you have no home their home Which has become the road. <laughs> well, then they're not homeless now, are they? <laughs> they're just a bum. But yeah. Oh. So. Yeah, because I'm I'm actually le I'm looking at what is it the Webster Dictionary version <laughs> of enter, and it's too. Literally, it does not even make any sort of like argument one way or the other. It just says to go or come in. Okay. Yeah. Then in that case, by Webster Dictionary definition of uh entrance dimension door into a home counts as entering the home which means the vampire cannot cast dimension door into a residence that they don't have already permission to get into and by that definition i would state that that's an area you can't dimension door into so they would take the bludgeoning damage and the spell would fizzle yeah and because it doesn't yeah. it wouldn't matter if there's like an object in the way they could be just flat there right in the middle of the like a hallway and, but they, they're not allowed, they, they don't have any prior, um, if they don't have any prior invitation to enter that, that humble abode, then yeah, then the spell would most likely fail. Yeah. Yeah, because, I, like, how I see it, at least with the Forbiddens, is, like, literally, there is a, phys like, almost, like, force field yeah. on the front door, unless you get permission, yeah. where it's, like, literally, you could shove that guy as hard as you can into that doorway, 
he ain't moving. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think of it all, uh, almost like a dome that perfectly surrounds the building you're trying to enter. And that, you know, if, you know falls down almost the second the, the, uh, the, the resident's occupant's like, yeah, sure, come on in. Yeah. But now here's another question then. How would hotels work? And like motels and such? Because that is, would typically be the residency of the owner of the hotel or motel. Now, now, see, here's where things get interesting. Do you count the lobby as a residence, or do you count the rooms as residences? Because I count the rooms as residences in a hotel. Yeah, because you don't have people sleeping in the lobby of like an yeah. inner hotel. People. Get but then you can bring up the, the. But then you can bring up the point. In just a normal home, do you do you sleep in the living room? Okay, let's be honest. Some of us probably do, but we don't always sleep in the living room. <laughs> So in that instance, Some hotel rooms you, have living rooms. But in that instance, would you consider only the bedroom the residency? I consider the hotel room the residency. Because some hotel rooms have, like, a couch and a TV, as well as a bed. Well, not just so, in the living room. No, like, like, well, I, I say the living room, yeah. I mean just, like, in, like, the lobby, is what I'm saying. No, talking. like, I've seen hotel rooms that have had that the as well. The heads just in the lobby? It's... No, not the beds in the that's room. That's what I'm saying. Th- no, like a couch and a TV in the room. That, yeah, no. In the hotel. Those exist. So, so I would consider the room the residence of the occupant if it's booked. If it's not booked, it's not currently occupied like s- by an individual. No, it's not a residence of an individual. Like, like I said, though, this is this is getting a little tricky because, as I've previously stated, if you go by that logic where you consider the individual rooms to be the residencies whether or not they are or whether they are occupied or not then by that logic if you were to apply it to say just a normal house then let's say you use dimension door into a bathroom nobody lives in the fucking bathroom you use the bathroom it's a a utility place almost and that would work how well how well how i look at it with an inn or a hotel is the lobby is a is a place of business because you're going to be paying for that room or someone's going to be uh, reserving a room for you, you almost... but then each of those each of those rooms is considered a separate residence. I guess what you can consider it as is almost like a storefront. So like if yeah. you enter yeah. if you enter a store, now yeah now that's another question, because what if a store owner lives in the store that they're trying to sell their wares in? Then the residence would be the area that they live in and not the storeroom. Hmm. Because that's technically not their residence, that's their place of business. Now I need to Google what constitutes as a residence. <laughs> a residence is a place you live in. I assume it'll be like something like a building that you live within. Yeah, because if I'm, because uh, if I look at it, I'm, th- I'm thinking, all right, okay. If you got uh, the store owner who lives in the apartment above, your vampire, this... he could totally just smash in the window of the storefront and do whatever he wants. Okay. But if he tries to smash in the window of the residence and tries to enter, he couldn't. Yeah. So I just found a legal definition for residence uh, from an Ontario government website, actually. <clears throat> At its simplest level, residence implies that a person is living in a jurisdiction, which includes eating, sleeping, and or working in that place. A person may reside in a place even if he or she is not physically present there from time to time. So that's what legally constitutes as a residence in Canadian law. <laughs> well, in D&D law, I would consider a residence a house or a place you live. You don't live in the storeroom. You don't have, like, your well, fridge no, and your but microwave you... sitting next to the potions. No, but you may There work. is some that do... But you may work in that place. Well, I mean, yeah, but in in the case where, like, say you have a restaurant, right, and the restaurant's kitchen is your personal kitchen, which is, I believe, against the law, uh, that would con- that would possibly be considered part of the residence. But I wouldn't. I mean, do you count? What do you count as like the living space of a person? Okay, but. Which is the layman's definition for a residence? But then here's the basics. I would consider would be. It has to have a place of, uh, for general rest, like sleep, and that sort of okay. thing, and the ability to probably make food, at least. But now I have another question. So let's say there's a gang of adventurers camping out in a forest, 
where you know they've set up their campfire they've set up their tents and you know they've sitting around the fire would a vampire be en able to enter that campfire because well they sleep there they're eat they're cooking there even but they're within the forest and the forest i would say the tent yeah the, the vampire can't enter the tent but the vampire can enter the camp site because it's not their residence. The residence is like the tent. Okay, fair enough. And also, if your residence is a tent for like a month, that's a sad existence. And what vampire would even mess with people that are that? Dead there, there are rock? some, there are some cruel vampires out there. I'm sure. But <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So now I can see. I can definitely see your point. That I think of it as being a devil's advocate. You know. Yeah, is these... I, I think that's a good thing for a debate. Because you yeah. gotta... No, you wanna be... You wanna do this as, like, the player who's just trying everything to poke a hole so they can make it work. And that's... Like, yeah. that's it's a job. good way to think about it. <laughs> and you're doing it and wrong. And almost every campaign I'm in, that, that, is, that is usually my job. <laughs> so... So, here's another question, right? Yeah. This applies to both arcane vampires, like, arcane vampire casters, as well as cleric vampires. Okay. Uh, Temple of the Gods slash Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion. Like, Mordekainen's Mansion, that makes sense. It's the vampire's house. They own it. Okay. Uh, so that does... Temple of the Gods, on the other hand, creates a temple that you can... You, it's essentially like the cleric version of Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion, except it's a temple to your god. Do you have to ask your god permission to enter the Temple of the Gods spell? Well, here's my logic, okay? Who, who would live in that in that temple? Would you consider it a residency? Because a uh, church, for instance, yeah. that can be considered a... And residency for the priest. That can be considered yeah. a residency for the priest. Lord, forgive me. A monastery? Is that the correct term? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can consider churches, some of them are monasteries, where, yes, the church, the priests and nuns will actually live in that area. Yes, then in that case... Not only would it be a place of worship, but it would be some sort of degree of home. Now, in a temple yeah. of gods in this instance, who would live here? Does anybody live here? Uh, Is it, can it be considered a monastery towards your god? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, so that's funny. So you can also choose a type of creature that can't enter the temple of the gods. One of the types of creatures is undead. So you can actually make Why a temple would of you the do gods that? that you can't <laughs> enter. Well, like to keep vampires out. Actually, but what if, in this enough. instance, you're a vampire cleric? Yeah, you wouldn't do that, but it's just fun <laughs> to forbid yourself from entering your own You wouldn't do it, temple. right? Here's, here's yeah, the temple to the god of light. <laughs> okay. Here's the temple to the god of light. Oh, that's and, another uh, good question. Uh, cleric vampire. What happens if they cast daylight? Oh, yeah. They would probably, they let's, be honest, right? let's be honest, they'd probably take some sort of <laughs> recoil damage from that. <laughs> I, I feel like you would be blessed with... See, now I want to play a cleric vampire that's, like, been cursed with powers by a... a like They're a all light, light powers, too. <laughs> so, the, yeah, so they have access to powers like create... Uh, what is it? Create water. Um... Daylight, my... turn on dead, but there okay, it affects okay. them as well. My logic <laughs> towards them casting daylight: the only way that they would not take recoil damage is if they were entirely covered from head to toe. So I'm talking like welding yeah. mask, like fucking oh, yeah. work gloves, probably an apron over a cloak, and like like work boots or something, just like completely covered from head to toe, wearing probably like a fucking sunglasses under that welding mask. Does every yeah. every fucking precaution over so that they don't take damage like, from that. That'd be my. We're life. talking the suit. For, we're talking the suit from Castlevania, like yeah. where it is head to do head to toe, no skin exposed. Yeah, the, there's like glass the, between them and the sun or something. I know exactly like what suit you're talking about. Actually, one of the fucking yeah, one of the uh, vampire leaders. Yeah, they have a, a an, an armor set that's entirely meant for fighting in the day. They would need something like that. Is my logic. Yeah. In order, yeah. but if if it's just like no, they they just got maybe like a cowl on or something. Yeah, they're probably gonna take damage from their own daylight. Yeah. Yeah. It, like honestly, even if it's like, even if they are covered head to toe, and if it's like super thin material, like honestly, we're talking like the people who experienced burns, uh, 
from the nuclear from like nuclear weapons like they're still gonna get burns underneath yeah. no light whatsoever would be able would, like should be able to seep through or like a yeah. darkness spell if they stand in the darkness spell and fire the no. daylight outside of it because dark the darkness of the spell doesn't allow any light magical or non-magical to enter that's such a True. roundabout way of doing it but i guess that's how you would have to do it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, but that's sacrifice. I mean, that's sacrificing two spell slots just for, to get one going, though. Also, one of them they mo they may both be concentrations, which means someone else has to cast darkness. Yeah, <laughs> which would be really funny. So, if, if if anything, I think if we were to oh, interesting. Oh. Darkness is concentration. Daylight isn't. Oh, so what you so you can do it. <laughs> It takes a second level spell and a third level spell to do it, but you can do it. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's two spell slots. So <laughs> to to get to get a very quick summary of so far what we discussed, the, the playing a vampire cleric is just a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's playing cleric on hard mode. You essentially, <laughs> yeah. Like you are literally doing this either for the pure story potential it has, which it does, or the challenge. It has a lot of story potential, but my god, would it be so damn challenging? And you... Essentially, every move you make, you would have to ask the DM. Because there are so many fine things here that constitutes yeah. what a vampire is actually allowed to do or not. And there is actually a section on player characters as vampires on page 295 of the player's handbook. Or, uh, sorry, the monster manual. So you can do it! <laughs> There's rules it, for it. Just, f you can do it, but Why? should you? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, they, they have it there in case a player gets bitten by a vampire okay. and turns into a vampire themselves. Yeah, it's like, vampirism. Like, vampirism off. is... Yeah. That's a bit of a different... That's more of a curse than anything. That, that That's definitely curable, but let's say you're born as a vampire. Well, guess what? <laughs> that's rare. You're fucked. Then you're a true vampire at that point. You're even more powerful. You are more powerful, yeah. but also... Good luck doing anything. <laughs> you also don't have stat blocks as a true vampire, but true vampires, aren't they, like... Can't true vampires, like, go out in the sun? I mean, look. Like, don't they have, like, I mean, like, less of the... I'm pretty sure, like, true vampires have, like, fewer... They're, like, stronger and also have fewer of the weaknesses that normal vampires have, if I remember correctly. I don't know, but... Yeah, vampires are interesting to say the least also they have spider climb i didn't realize yeah no they do they're freaks uh <laughs> <laughs> trust me we have we had a we had a vampiric uh elephant in one of our previous campaigns oh it's pretty freaky seeing one of those things just walk up at like a 90 degree angle <laughs> <laughs> i love it. actually moving faster I than mean. you as well <laughs> but uh Let's see here. So, what what have we discussed? So, so we talked about running water. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Legal definition of residency. <laughs> yep. We got I, over that. I can't believe we had to bring law into this. Is there what? What else could we bring up with vampires? I was in, Don't even start with stake to the heart. Don't even go. There. Oh, let's see stake to the heart now. All right. No. Vampires. Look, I mean. Who are we kidding? A stake to the heart, it's gonna kill anything. It's gonna kill everyone, yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing, because I've been reading Bram Stoker's Dracula, not in preparation for this, just a funny coincidence. And in Dracula, you don't kill a vampire with a stake to the heart. You prevent a vampire from regenerating. So, stick okay, to the heart. I'll, I'll read out the definition as well for, for, for anyone who's fucking still watching this thing. Stake to the heart. If a <laughs> piercing weapon made of wood... So this can be a wooden nail. I don't know why you'd make a nail out of wood, but you could. Or maybe just... I mean, the stake is like a foot long chunk of sharpened wood. It's actually not specified. But, yeah, if a piercing weapon, so it needs to be... Obviously needs to be sharp, and needs to be made out of wood. I don't think it matters what wood, as long as it's made of wood. Is yeah, driven yeah. into the vampire's heart while the vampire is incapacitated in its resting place. Then the vampire is paralyzed until the stake is removed. So it doesn't actually kill them. Yeah, it doesn't kill them. That's that's what I was saying. Like with Bram Stoker's Dracula, and it doesn't actually kill them. It just keeps them from being able to move or regenerate. Not to mention, it actually specifies the vampire has to already be incapacitated in their resting place, which means you would have to find yeah. a layer of sorts. 
Which is also true, Bram Stoker's Dracula in the scene where they do that. Yeah, so, yeah, it is. So you'd have a lot of this is accurate. <laughs> in, in, in other words, there are a few ways you can go about doing this. You'd have to like knock knock one out some way, uh, or sneak up on it like while it's sleeping. But non-lethal damage? I don't know. You, you but regardless, you're not killing it with a stake. You, it doesn't actually kill it. I mean, they're pretty much. They might as well be dead. But yeah. if some, I don't know, peasant's like, hey, this steak looks kind of cool, and then just pulls it out, well, congratulations, ain't got to do it again. Yep. Yeah. And if anything, they're probably going to be more pissed generate. off now and probably paranoid. <laughs> but Yeah. Well, and if I remember correctly from, uh, Drac- from Dracula, literally they had uh, the uh, Van Helsing, he staked it, then cut off their head. Yeah, and then filled the mouth with garlic. That, that's how you had to deal with a vampire. That would That was the whole process. That would probably work, honestly. I mean it doesn't specify anywhere here if they hate garlic or anything. But Yeah, that's another weird thing. They don't <laughs> specify that anywhere. I I wouldn't say no, because if unless it's specified, I wouldn't think garlic would affect them. Yeah, it's it's not like wisteria for the demons and demon slayer. And it's just uh, the, the garlic is unpleasant the, the the funniest part about this whole thing the vampire yes they'll be bleeding out by the stake but also at the end of each of their turns which hold on D&D 5e how yeah. long every six the, seconds six seconds yep six seconds which means every six seconds they're regenerating about 20 hit points <laughs> yeah just, so they just can't move they can't move <laughs> and unless if actually no wait those the Hold on. Does the... Nope, it just says it's paralyzed, so it doesn't even stop the regeneration. Nope. It, it, it only stops See. the regeneration, I believe, if the vampire takes radiant damage or damage from holy water. This trait doesn't function at the start of the vampire's next turn. So, presume... Uh, running water this, also works. Wait, uh, does Silvered Blades also do that? Uh, That's an interesting thing. There's nothing on Silver. Nothing on Silver is listed. Okay, yeah, because I know that's specifically listed out for, for like, were- for like lycanthropy. Well, that's the thing. Lycanthropy and vampirism are two completely different things. One of them you turn into a furry, yeah. and the other you turn into a goth chick. So, I mean, pick your poison. Mmm, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> goth chick. So, uh, I mean... I mean, everybody we're remembers we're you know, right. Resident Evil Village, right? I mean, yeah. come on. Okay, okay, okay. Big okay, vampire okay. mommy. Listen <laughs> <laughs> bastards. All right, uh. Not my cup of tea, okay? But I wasn't one of those people. <laughs> and this is the... This, I'm actually reading the attributes as well. This is another very interesting thing. Misty Escape. When, it's H, when it drops to zero HP outside of its resting place, the vampire may transform into some sort of cloud of mist, as in the shape changer state. Instead of falling yep. unconscious, provided that it isn't in sunlight or running water. If it can't transform, it is destroyed. Which means the only way to kill it is to ensure there's some sort of running water or some sort of sunlight and get it to be. get it to set your baiting out misty escape, essentially. Otherwise, while it we'll has zero hit points, in mist form, it can't revert to its vampire form and must reach its resting place within two hours to be destroyed. That's another thing. Yeah. What if you just completely close up their their their, their, res, their residency? Like, if you burn down their house, they're dead. Yeah. And then what's in it, once it is in its resting place, it may revert back to its vampire form. But then it is still paralyzed until it regains at least one HP. After spending about an hour in its resting place with zero hit points, it then regains one HP. So, which is actually how it specifies that ties into the stake to the heart thing because it returns and it's paralyzed for an hour. So you just follow it back and then stake it in the heart. Yeah. Provided it doesn't have any sort of defensive measures and it's to a, protect itself, which it will. And it's a miss, let's be honest. You can yeah. see that. <laughs> yeah, you can what? still see the you miss. You can follow it. So yeah, well, I'm, Now that I'm thinking about it, with as this, like, a, for a player character, like, this... I mean, if they're within the town that they originated from, they are just unkillable. But if the unless the, the person knows, the second they go out of their hometown, they're fucked. Yeah, like as yeah. soon as they le- uh, reach, like they would have, you know, five ten miles out of town, <laughs> they're screwed. They would have to constantly <laughs> keep making new and new layers. But in that instance, well, see, what constitutes yeah. as a layer for a vampire? <laughs> That's true. Like, is a cart. 
count as a lair for a vampire as long as it's got its coffin and some soil in there? Is that just like a mobile home then? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an RV. Yeah. I'm just imagining the vampire that lives in the RV next to the lake. That's what it would have to be, in my opinion. Yeah. That's an yeah. adventurous vampire, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, but as, like, for a player character, I mean, they essentially have, if you if that whole wagon thing works, I mean, they're effectively unkillable. Yeah. As long as they that whole thing stays whole, they are effectively and unkillable. And stays hidden. And, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, just lock it up. Uh, put maybe, like, a vent or something, like, underneath it. <laughs> so here's another question. Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion. Does that work as a vampire's lair? This is out of my domain. I don't know anything about that mansion. I, I mean... See, I would consider that it's not, and the only reason is every 24 hours, the spell ends. You have to recast it. You can't put your coffin in there. Because anything from outside that goes into the mansion comes back out when the spell ends. Well, how long does a spell it's last? True. 24, 24 hours. 24 hours? Now, see, I'm the type of DM that states you can expend the spell slot to keep the spell up and essentially restart the clock on it. Yeah, that makes... Without having to, like, recast it. That makes logical sense to me, yeah. I, I'm personally a, a bigger fan of the 8th level Mighty Fortress spell, which is, like, Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion, but more permanent. Because that one lasts for a week. And if you keep casting it once a day, uh, or once once a week for, like, a year, it becomes a permanent castle. Then it can be used as a vampire's lair. But... Yeah. Yeah, because I, I'm gonna pro I'm gonna agree with you on that. Because, I mean, if it's only there for 24 hours, yeah. you can't really just, like, say this is my home in 24 hours. Right, yeah. Like, yeah, I would say you would have to at least live there for somewhere around, like, six months or something like that. Yeah. For it to be considered a residence. Yeah. Or lair. Hmm. Yeah, no, dude, vampires are weird. Cart would be a very sad lair for a vampire. I mean, you're saying it's sad, but it's like min-maxing, bro. Well, I mean, it's min-maxing until the 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 monster you're like. For you're gonna have to you're gonna have to drag the cart into like the lair like of the final monster that you're killing or something. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just I'm just imagining like let's say the final boss for your campaign is like a wizard or something, right? And a wizard fights you, knows you're a vampire, and they kill the party. They know where you are. Yeah, because you're like, you're now a you're mist. A you're now a mist. Provided that they there's just no track you down and kill you. Provided yeah that there's no daylight or anything. Which could be a very interesting idea for like a new campaign if you get in a TPK where one player is a vampire. Say that they got staked through the heart, and then like two hundred years later, a peasant finds you and pulls <laughs> the stake out. And then your next character is like the vampire trying to wake up and remember what happened to it after a 200 year coma. It's just a destiny guardian. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna see a lot of things that you won't understand. Yep. I mean, straight up, that's just like, well, I'm now an amnesiac and I remember none of the skills I had. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that case, then would it would it remember that it's a vampire? Would it remember? I mean, you'd probably remember if you were a vampire. Would you? No matter how much time passes. I would. If I was a vampire, I'd be like, I look down and realize, huh, I'm a little paler than usual. And my teeth are kind of sharp. Oh, I'm a vampire. <laughs> like, I feel like you'd very quickly, like, look in a mirror or try to walk outside and get burned, and you'd put the pieces together eventually. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I feel like the best way to do that would be you know you know kind of what happened but it's like it's been so long that your memories have kind of fragmented yeah that it's like i can remember you know names and places like different thing like different voices but i can't put a whole picture together yeah cuz like straight up amnesiac is like really interesting to try and play cuz it's the you can do the whole level where it's like I only remember my name and what I am yeah or just like you're completely blank slate and it's it's kind of the same thing with like Kenku 
right? Because like Kenku, you don't start the campaign knowing no words. You start the campaign knowing some words and being able to mimic them. So then you have to go through this process as a Kenku player of like, okay, what phrases have I heard? Which ones would stick in my mind? Which ones would I think are useful? And you have to build like almost this this short list of um, phrases that you know of. It's kind of a similar thing to playing an Amnesiac. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of like vampire players is making a vampire warlock, where your patron is a great vampire, like a like a true vampire, and so they give you a portion of their power, and that's your warlock features. It's not like an eldritch being giving you powers. It's you've been cursed by a vampire and sent on a quest, and maybe the vampire like talks to you. You know, using like the dream spell, or or just communicating you via sending. See, if, and so if we need really creative character ideas, we could just get Blau in here. <laughs> True. So that's that's something that I'm going to be kind of working on on the side is uh, the the vampire lord warlock patron. Yeah, because. Yeah, I mean, especially if they're a true vampire, they definitely hold a lot of power. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of strength. They've they've definitely got enough influence to be like, yeah, okay, you're my thrall now, but you're like my head thrall. Go forth and find things for me. So yeah, that the, is that wouldn't that be very similar then to the noble trait where you have a bunch of serfs? <laughs> kind of, yeah, except. Instead of you being the noble, you're one of the serfs. That's kind of fucked, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I'd want to play that, honestly. That'd be really funny. It's like, uh, you could even have, like, um... I know I'm going back to Demon Slayer with this, but it makes a lot of sense. Like, finding someone with rare blood that gives the Vampire Lord their power. Like, more power. And so that's their whole thing. They're like, hey, you're my scout. Okay, you go out, you try... You have a portion of my strength go out and find some people with rare blood that will increase my power and increase no, 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 my no, no. influence. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking it's like, yeah, you're just like strolling through town, yeah? And then yeah. You, you get you get like a a call from your setting stone. It's 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 the it's the big dog. It's the big cheese. You'd be like, hey, yeah, can you go get, can you uh, before you come back, can you bring some like, I don't know, like Cheetos or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I... a vampire, the vampire sugar daddy being like, hey, pick up the food on, the, on your way back. So yeah, maybe so wait, legit, you're Can just you the, my dry you're the vampire intern? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. You're vampire just the intern unpaid warlock. intern. Honestly, that would be a really funny way to play a warlock. <laughs> I, I'm still working on that path. And also, another thing is, like, unlike, path of the intern. like an arch, unlike an archfey or a great old one or a fiend, the vampire doesn't give you any magical powers. Nope. So it would be, like, all your class features aren't, like... You know, you can teleport 30 feet. You can re-roll some of your dice. You can talk to people through telepathy. It's like, no, you're just stronger. You can walk on walls. You can turn into a bat. Which, like, I think there is already a thing in Warlock where you can turn into a bat, and if there isn't, there should be. I mean, but, straight up, at that point, like, you, it would be a great multi-class of, like, a Hexblade yeah. and a Barbarian. Well, well, it would be a Warlock patron. Like, the 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 patron of the vampire itself so it gives you like i don't even know what abilities it would give you off the bat I would if have this really doesn't already it, exist we might have just stumbled across something that may be very fun to play i mean i've been working on it for a bit i could i could polish it up and post it somewhere one what, one day we'll release it <laughs> one day we'll release a book of all of our homebrew stuff <laughs> have a fun time i'm telling you fucking patron of the intern I'm st hey man, I'm still working on the uh what is it? The uh the uh fractured domain cleric. Yeah. Oh man, I forgot about that. That was a good one. I still have all I still have all the notes. I'd have yeah, to look at it again. Keep working on it's that. Just one. a matter of balancing everything, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, cuz it's really weird and it's and then you have all these like mood swings and other things, yeah. but Yeah. But uh is there anything else to talk about vampires? Or have we basically run dry the uh, the well of this I'm, episode? I mean, I'm running out of things to be the devil's advocate for, so... But, uh, yeah. uh, Mug, if, if you have anything to add? I mean, all things considered, 
the vampire is just going to be a really interesting thing to play as a cleric and then also a really interesting thing to work out with like how the divine energy works and how it affects a vampire does it make them afraid how do holy symbols really like yeah. hit the all of that would have to follow oh. I, I would imagine under the DM's discretion though here's a yeah. question what if you're a cleric of Vecna because Vecna's a lich he's undead himself so does Vecna give you the ability to turn other undead <laughs> and if so can you cast turn undead on Vecna Wait a fucking minute. That's forbid- I mean, you can't, because he's a god. That's forbidden he's knowledge. He's also undead. This is forbidden knowledge. He's going to come Only after us now knows. with his one arm. Oh, no. I, I <laughs> want to see. I want to see that one vampire cleric just going up with, like, the biggest balls ever, t- casting turn undead, running like a bitch as Vecna runs straight in the other direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, they'd probably get, oh. like, internally smited for, like, forever. But it'd still be yeah. fucking hilarious. That'd be one hell of a way to go out, let's be honest. Oh, that yeah, you know damn good. well Vecna would just be like, Alright, <laughs> this little shit right here. <laughs> How the fuck Listen that? here, you little shit. I made you level 18, now you try to turn me? <laughs> that would be really funny, though. I, I'm really interested to see, though, like, how would you play a cleric of Vecna as a warlock? Or as a... Not as a warlock. As a vampire? As a, um, a vampire, yeah. I mean, if we... Because yeah. if you're undead, if we ever, like, how does Vecna <laughs> feel about vampires? If we ever run a campaign... I mean... <laughs> oh, a level 15 one-shot where one of us is a vampire trying to turn Vecna? <laughs> it doesn't have to be a one-shot. I mean, it could start from the beginning. Honestly, true. But, like, yeah. honestly, though, it is, it's a really interesting to think about because it's just, like... Honestly, there is a couple of, like, gods of just, like, I just, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, there's a few of them where it's, like, kind of, like, Death Domain, right? Like, Death Domain, one of the domains there is, like, Orcus, the guy who, the demon that controls undead. So, yeah. how would a cleric of Orcus, like, a Death Domain cleric of Orcus do with spells like that? I don't know. Yeah, because it's really just interesting to think about of just, like, all the intricacies of just, like, alright, they're undead, your character's undead, how does this spell affect yeah. them because this is supposed to be something effective against undead? Or, like, even more crazy, like, you're a vampire cleric, your god is Vecna, he's also an undead, you both have, you're both undead, so how are you able to fire a guiding bolt which is radiant damage don't worry about it how do you make guiding bolt how do you do spirit guardians or spiritual weapon uh the shady merchant like I, at the corner of the street said i could i suppose what you would do in that case is you'd work it out with your dm where it does necrotic damage instead of radiant yeah you would have to yeah you could probably which change would be it so over cool or like imagine um imagine like the reverse of guiding bolt where it's necrotic damage and it imposes disadvantage on that creature's next attack. Oh yeah. That could be really interesting. It's kinda yeah, like no. what, uh, what Jester or Laura Bailey worked out with Matt in Campaign Two of Critical Role, where her um her oh, what's it called? Oh uh, I don't remember. Oh, what's it called? That that feature, that that spell where Hellish Rebuke how her hellish mm. rebuke is cold damage when it specifies fire damage in the spell oh like, yeah things like that are really cool and I like it when DMs kind of modify things slightly to uh, fit it into the setting better yeah cause it makes it actually feel really unique and gives us something new to an ability that's been yeah. well established yeah yeah cause like I would definitely want to see a vampire cleric whose whole shtick is literally just, like, necrotic damage. Yeah, that would be cool. Because, yeah, you have, like, uh, what is it? Oh, what's the spell? It's, uh... I think I know which one you're talking about. Oh, gosh. Something wounds. Um, uh, inflict wounds. Cure inflict, wounds? Inflict wounds, I think. Yeah. Because, yeah, I feel... I feel that was necrotic often. damage. Yeah, it's not chronic. Yeah, it's... But yeah, it's like essentially an entire cleric built around that. Yeah. That would be interesting. 
Or like, um, what about Flame Strike? Because half of Flame Strike is radiant damage. So would it be fire damage and necrotic damage? Yeah, almost like spitting uh, like a yeah, spinning almost like a hellish fire. Yeah, like the like the green flame that the hive have in Destiny. Yeah, exactly. That would be pretty cool. Alright. Yeah, I mean that's really it. Alright. Yeah, I think we're running out of stuff to talk about with vampires, so we're time to end the episode? Yeah. Yeah. I... yeah. Or do you have something else to add? Because if you got something else to add, I'm... we can talk about it. I'm trying to think right now, cause I, like, cause I'm, I'm, I've been tapped dry. Yeah. Vampires aren't exactly oh. my field of expertise. You'll find that out next episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, honestly, no. Let's, I guess, you know, let's sign off. We we don't have any outro music unless you want me to just like fucking do some random guitar shit and just kill everyone's ears. No. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've been winter. Rat, I guess. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Alright. Well, it's it's been fun talking about it. I'm mug, so <laughs> Yeah, adios then. Mm -hmm.